Welcome to K-State Online. I am Mason Voth, joined by Drew Galloway, and we come to you today ready to talk a little wide receiver at K-State. Yesterday in the recruiting update, we talked about wide receiver and secondary, and even before I, I was reading some of the reaction to it, I started thinking, you know, wide receiver would be a good one to talk about coming up because we've talked about, hey, what can Avery Johnson's ceiling be and how that kind of ties into playmakers now. We haven't done that since they added Dylan Edwards to the equation, but we know that there are going to be plenty of options. We talked running back, what the direction was pre-transfer portal opening in the spring, and we knew you know DJ Giddens and everything would be set there. But receiver, we haven't given a ton of attention to, despite the fact that I, I think my expectations and probably some others are going to be a little bit higher for this group than what you normally have for K-State receivers because it's been a long time since, you, since you've had – a number of guys that you go, oh, they could make a play for you. So I'll start with this question for you, Drew. Just on the baseline, what do you expect from K-State wide receivers in 2024? Because I'll set this stage. We know that Dylan Edwards and DJ Giddens are two really talented running backs. DJ Giddens is probably going to be one of the three best running backs in the Big 12 this coming season. And Dylan Edwards might be one of the three most lethal weapons in the Big 12 this season. So how much will actually have to go on the receivers and how much can they actually come through and produce for K-State? I think that it's safe to expect K-State's receivers to really take a jump. I mean, I, I talked about it yesterday in the, the recruiting show where there's just been so much Ross or uh, turnover with the receivers coach position that I don't think that anybody ever really felt comfortable in the in the receiver room because it was such a revolving door and the offense has really innovated and now you had a new coach and then you had a new coach again and then a new coach again and this is only going to be the second time in the last seven seasons that the receivers coach has been the same guy so i think that that alone you can probably set the bar the bar a little bit higher and then i think that k-state will be a little bit more dynamic in the passing game with avery johnson so I think that my expectation would probably be that you, you probably would want one of the receivers to have the most yards by a wide receiver in the Chris Kleiman era, because I mean, the, the mark isn't very high. I, I believe it's like 560, 600 yards is all. And, and I think that one of the receivers could easily do that this year. Yeah, the it's it's not a high bar to cross if you're looking for it. Uh, last season, Ben Sennett had 676, uh, but that was a tight end. Uh, Malik Knowles in 2022 was good. 725 is what he got up to. And really, I, I can remember talking after last season, 2022 that is, not 2023, but the 22 Big 12 championship team, like that might be the best wide receiver production you've gotten as a whole and where you trust the receivers you have. Since like 2014, you know, yeah, uh, obviously, agree. I mean, 2014, nobody's come close to that in a long time at K State because you had two 1,000 yard receivers there in Tyler Lockett and Curry Sexton. But in terms of the fact that by the end of 2022, Malik Knowles, Phillip Brooks, and Cade Warner were reliable wide receivers. And then you could also throw Ben Sennett into the mix there. And so it seemed like, hey, you were in a good spot. Last season, there were a lot of other there are a lot of different guys that could step up and maybe do something for you, but it was never going to be consistent and feel like it was going to come through. Now with what you have, you know, going on, on this year, you have Brown and, and Johnson that returned from a season ago. And then Cephas comes into the fold. You probably would like to see him out there. And then Garrett Oakley is going to take the Ben Sennett spot, essentially. He'll be the tight end this year. And we saw some flashes when he got in late in games, but we never really got to see Garrett Oakley, you know, all by himself out there as the main guy because you're not going to take Senate off the field, although he made some plays in the Pop Tarts Bowl. And then you have the other weapons. The running backs are going to be heavily involved in the passing game, I would imagine. DJ Giddens was really successful when he got some throws his way last season. We know Dylan Edwards with his talent, there's going to be a specialty there. And then Jaden Jackson is back, which is really nice for depth for K State. And then there are some young guys on there. I, I threw Trey Spivey up there because I think he's the one that people are most interested in. So of all the weapons, how do you think it sorts out into who is actually going to be on the field and, and maybe percentage of how the targets or production breaks down for them? Ooh, see, I, I was going to do like a tiers of production. So well, that's, yeah, that's probably good right there. 
we're, we're on the same wavelength a little bit here. So I think that tier one will probably be Jace Brown, Keegan Johnson. I just think that those two probably have the most juice to them at the wide receiver position that especially Jace Brown, we saw how explosive he was. And, and I know that people are really kind of wait and see on Keegan Johnson after how last season went and how much kind of hype was surrounding him last year. But I, I think that he's probably the one that's really due to break out because this is, again, it's his second season and the scheme and his second season with Matthew Middleton. And I think that you really saw him turn a corner near the end of last season. And hopefully he can build on that. Uh, probably tier two, I would say would be Dante Cephas, Garrett Oakley. I would honestly think about throwing Dylan Edwards in this tier two at uh, targets at, at, even though he's not a, a wide receiver, but at running back, uh, because I just think that he's probably the most dangerous slot player that K-State has. And then that next tier is probably where you see uh, Jaden Jackson, Trace Spivey, DJ Giddens. Uh, now, in terms of talking about some of those other guys and, and where they'll be, Spivey is is probably in that mix. Although he, you know, people bring up his name a lot. Is there anybody that isn't currently on the radar for? Hey, they're going to be out on the field making some plays. Like Jace Brown last year, I don't think when the season started, we thought by the end of the year that Jace Brown was going to be the best receiver on the team. Uh, I, some may not have even thought that he was going to see the field a significant amount last season. But halfway through last year, he became the number one receiver on the team. So maybe not to the extent of Jace Brown, but are there any guys that we haven't mentioned or on the fr- or on the fringe that you think could step up and you know by the last half of the season? Are significant contributors. Uh, I'm not sure again because of the the role that Jace Brown played last year is just so different that I think that it's going to be a little bit harder for somebody else to really emerge unless they're really tearing it up. But the guy that kind of keeps getting mentioned as somebody that really had a good spring and they're really looking forward to to, to see what he can do in the fall is Andre Davis uh, from Blue Valley and originally from Texas. That he is a big bodied receiver, kind of like Trace Spivey. And is kind of something that K-State has really lacked because it seems like when K-State's had good receivers, it's kind of like running back where they've kind of been on the smaller guy or at the smaller side. So I'm excited to see kind of how Trace Spivey and Andre Davis come along because I, I know that since Trace Spivey doesn't count for this, Andre Davis is probably the next best option as somebody who can really emerge. Yeah, no, that's probably a uh, a good a good person to put out there. We saw a good connection between them last year. Uh, when it came to uh, Avery Johnson and, and Trey Spivey and early on, and I think that there's probably some good things uh, to come from there. And I think people would be excited about that because Spivey has the tools and is the the talented type of athlete to be able to get people excited. Now, the, the other thing that I'll throw your way on this, and I was digging around and kind of looking because I like to compare this and see how it goes. I think 2022 was the first time and I can't remember the exact stat now, but it was the first time in a while that K-State had three players that had gone for 400 yards receiving, each of them at least. Uh, K-State has not had three players with 500 or more receiving yards since 2012's team. That was Chris Harper, Tyler Lockett, and Tremaine Thompson. Do you think that that's something that could be in play this year for K-State, is having three guys hit the 500-yard mark, or is it one of those scenarios where – there's so many guys that might be able to play a role that the the volume will not be there for, you know, if we're saying that the third guy is Cephas, well, he's going to have to share balls coming his way to DJ Giddens and Dylan Edwards and Garrett Oakley and Trey Spivey and other guys to where that's not possible. I don't think that it's necessarily impossible. I mean, last season, K-State actually came really close. That was only with Jace Brown having 27 catches. He still got 437 yards receiving. So I think that it's possible. It'll just probably take somebody being really explosive when they get the ball. That That's where you're really hoping that Dante Cephas, Cephas can really explode. Or, I mean, I think that he's just been around long enough that people kind of forget, but Jaden Jackson was one of the more underrated players on the entire team last season. So you're kind of hoping that he can really take that next jump because this will be his third year in the program and he'll be able to hopefully really take off and excel as the season gets going. But I think that it's definitely possible to get three guys with 500 yards. Uh, Dante Cephas is probably the, the safest option, but don't sleep on Garrett Oakley either. 
Yeah, it'll be it'll be interesting to see now in terms of because there's also another element to this, and I, I thought of this as well. When you have the two running backs you do have now, and we know what DJ Giddens can do as the number one back, and we have a pretty good idea of what we think the talent of Dylan Edwards can look like in this offense. What do you think the breakdown of run to pass ends up being for K-State? Because you know, Matt Wells already said back in the spring he wants to he wants to throw to score and run to win. How how do you think this works out? And is that going to lead to more of a emphasis? in the past game or is it going to be you just have the talent to run the ball really well so the past game even if it is executing at a high level it's not as much of a, a point of emphasis I, i'm really interested to see how this split works out because like you said there's a lot of talent in the backfield and, and don't forget that avery johnson also an excellent runner but i, I would say that it'll probably be pretty close to 50 50 if not like 52 53 percent maybe even more pass because I think that Casey it really wants to showcase Avery Johnson and really kind of maximize his talent and his potential. And you want to, you want to have probably the guy that's your best player to have the ball at for most of the game. So if you can have 53, 52% pass, I think that's probably a good ratio for what Casey it wants to do. Yeah, it'll be, it'll be fascinating to see how it works out. It just feels like the amount of options that are there, it's it's significant for K-State right now. And do you think there's any element to this where it's, I'll call it K-State brain for everybody, where <laughs> as we talk about how much they've lacked for, you know, quality receiving play uh, over the years and nobody that's really stood out, uh, are we once again falling into the trap of building up guys into more than what they actually are? Or is it possible that this really is a, a legit receiving room for K-State? I think that this is probably a legitimate receiving room for K-State because you really saw the flashes with Jace Brown last season. And I think that you would expect and hope that he gets even better than he was at the end of last season, this season. And then you saw the flashes for Keegan Johnson. If he stays healthy, he can be a very, very good player as well. And then Dante Cephas didn't have the best year at Penn State, but he was very solid at Kent State. And now he's back with Matthew Middleton. And I think that Jaden Jackson is a guy that you could, you've you kind of seen that you can rely on. And then you have two really high ceiling guys with Trace by Andre Davis. So it's all about maximizing the talent and maximizing the potential. But I think that this is probably the most receivers that I would be comfortable that K-State has had on the field in quite a while. I mean, I just listed off six guys that I think I would be okay with if I saw them get all of the receiver snaps in a game. And last year, there were times where I was probably like three or four. So I, I think that that's a really good thing. And I, I don't really think that it's K-State brain for this because you're expecting some younger guys to really step up and be even better. Yeah. All right. Last thing, because one of the comments on the recruiting video was maybe questioning Matthew Middleton yesterday. What what do you think of Matthew Middleton as the receivers coach and and what – He's helping build for K State, and you acknowledged it earlier. Like K State has not had a lot of continuity at that position coaching job. It's been a revolving door since they came in. It was Jason Ray, and then they moved it around, and it ended up. I think Messingham ended up with the job at one point, and then he, you know, obviously had to move on. And then Thad Ward was there. Thad Ward left for Illinois, and then Matthew Middleton. And I, am I missing somebody amongst those four? Or, I think it's four and five years. I think that it, seems about it, right. It's four and five years, and I think it's five and seven because Andre Coleman was right before climbing. Okay, came yeah, in. that's that might be what it is then. So yeah, going back to the last year, because uh, Philip yeah. Philip Brooks and Seth Porter, shout out to them. They had five wide receiver coaches in six seasons at yeah. K State. That's that's impressive. So Matthew Middleton, do you? I mean, number one, it's probably just a win that he's here for another season. That's big for K State. Uh, but in yes. terms of what he's done and, and how he's developed guys in the past, because you mentioned he's got the Cephas connection at Kent State. Yeah, I think that he's a really good uh, coach at developing guys because, it, like like we said, like Dante Cephas was at Kent State, so it's not like he was like some four or five star and recruit. And Tez out Walker of high was there with him. Yes, and I was about to say, and Tez Walker was also there, and it's not like those guys were either were either like highly regarded out of high school. 
So I think that that development is good uh, with him on his kind of uh, resume. And then you see what Jace Brown did last season as a true freshman. I know that he didn't recruit Jace Brown, but he was the one that kind of helped develop Jace Brown during the season and get getting him ready to play. So I think that it's still a little early to be really like too complimentary or too harsh on Matthew Middleton because there's just been such a revolving door there that just having stability, I think, is a good thing at K-State right now. And I also know that he's really heavily involved with how K-State's passing game operates. So I think that he is a very smart mind, very young, very energetic, and has been really good on the recruiting trail. So I, I think that it's a little too early to be uh, negative his way because he's only had the job for like 15, 16 months now. Yeah, and somebody brought it up on the boards yesterday, and I, I just kind of responded like, I, it was it was to our video yesterday talking about the guys they're looking at and everything. I don't know about you, but I, I really like what they've done the last two recruiting classes of yes. receivers. I They've added guys that obviously we see Jace Brown. People like Trey Spivey a lot, but you can even go back, you know, the class before that as well and see some things to like because, you know, I think Andre Davis has taken like a, a step forward in that. Um, and, and we, you know, we talked about, I guess he was the same class as Jace Brown, but the class after them who will be freshmen this coming year, Trey Davis and Jaquise Bradley Dimps are two guys that, they can fly, and there's a lot to like about them. And both at various points during the recruiting process were rated four stars by different services. So, like, they're, they they brought in some legit talent. So, the last two classes, 24 and 23, I really like what they've done there. Yeah, I really like what they've done with both receiving classes, too. It, it, it goes unnoticed because he's the guy that hasn't played yet this in his career yet because of uh, just where he was in his development. And that last year was such a developing year. But I said when Case 8 got Andre Davis that it was a really big win for Thad Ward because Andre Dav the level of recruit that Andre Davis was, Case 8 wasn't getting before Thad Ward took over. So being able to get Andre Davis then, and then now you're compiling that with adding Jaquise Bradley Dumps and Trey Davis, who are two guys that I think can be really, really good at Case 8 scheme if, because they're so they have such an ability to be elusive and get out in space and beat guys with their speed that I, I think that you're stacking good classes. And now I like the board that Matthew Middleton has this cycle as well. So the, the receiver room is getting better because they're getting better recruits. So I, I think it kind of goes hand in hand with good recruiting equals better room. And I think that uh, Middleton is a, is a, one of the better recruiters on the staff because when he figures out, what he wants in the receiver he really goes after them and really hunts them and has had a lot of success as well do you think andre davis is a guy that can maybe crack some playing time this year because i i think it, it sounds like there was some rapid growth for him within the last yes. year I, I think that the light is starting to kick on for him a little bit and, and it's like with trace Vivy. it's it, it just took a little bit of a it was a little bit of a learning curve once he stepped onto a college campus and this is the, the added advantage of Jace Brown and why I've mentioned it a few times, but I, it seems like people kind of just shrugged it off, especially about Trace Spivey compared to Jace Brown. Jace Brown had the benefit of being on, in, on campus in Manhattan last January and getting acclimated with the playbook, learning how to manage college classes and being an athlete. He had the added benefit of getting extra reps with Avery Johnson from January on. Like Trace Spivey and Andre Davis didn't show up on in, on campus in Manhattan until uh, June. So they were behind the eight ball a little bit. And it just takes freshmen some time. I mean, like, like I said, like part of the adjustment period is literally learning how to go to class and also have practice. So I, I think that when you have that learning curve that you're really starting to see the light kick on for both of them, which I think is really exciting for K-State. Yeah, that's probably good for everybody to, to kind of keep in mind and remember. But things shaping up pretty good for this receiver group at K-State. They have the quarterback to get the job done. We've seen flashes from all these guys at different points in their career. So it certainly seems like uh, if you put it all together and you can kind of project, K-State has themselves in a good spot with uh, receiving targets for Avery Johnson. So 
That will do it for Drew and I today. We'll be back again on Friday. We'll talk a little bit more about K-State and everything else going on around K-State athletics. Plenty of news going on over at KSO, so go find on three and get your football and basketball recruiting news. More stuff going down in the transfer portal for both sides. K-State certainly not that done there on football and on basketball. Um, they're far from done there, so they got work to do. We'll keep you up to date with it over at K-State Online. Thanks for watching today's edition of the KSO 